Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning to our online students as well. Welcome. All right, so before we get into today's class, let's just look at what we did last week. Last week, we looked at chapter four, overcoming inhibitions, right? So we also discussed on what inhibitions are, right? So inhibition basically means, right? What are the things that stop us from sharing the gospel with other people? Right, and some of you shared uh, some reasons uh, or some instances where we were, you know, unable to share the gospel. Right, and so some of them were not knowing what to say, feeling that nobody is interested in the gospel, fear of rejection or ridicule. Okay, what if they reject what I say? What if they make fun of me? Uh, you know, these are uh, inhibitions. Being ashamed. Sometimes we may be ashamed of the gospel. In a setting where we are in a church or in Bible college, we may not be ashamed. But what about when we are out there? Are we ashamed? Right? So uh, you know, it's important to establish the fact of what Jesus did for us. Right? He died on the cross for us, taking us as his children. So it was a humiliating death. But he did it for our sake. Right? So it's nothing that we must be ashamed of over time, over seasons, as we grow in life, as we grow in maturity. It's very important that we overcome this feeling of being ashamed. If, if you don't have it, if we don't have it, that's good. But in any way, if we feel ashamed, just ask God to remove that from our heart. Right? Because when we are ashamed of something, we cannot stand for it. Yes or no? Right? If we, are, if we are ashamed of Jesus, how can I stand for Jesus? If, if a brother or if you're, for example, you have an own brother or an own sister and you're ashamed of them, will you stand for them? Right. Of, of your parents, if you're ashamed of your parents, right? Uh, will you stand for them? No, right? So the moment we are free from this, right, we know what the Lord Jesus has done. It's a conviction in our heart. There's no place of, you know, feeling ashamed uh, of what the Lord Jesus did for us. Then there's fear of mixing with unsaved friends. Right? Sometimes we meet with people who are not Christians, uh, and we may feel that, hey, uh, you know, uh, what if I mix? What if I become a friend to him and his attitude rubs off on me, right? Or his character rubs off on me. Remember that light is greater than darkness. Right, so you are called to be a witness. You are called to be a testimony to the other person and not the other way around. Right? And then there were some other excuses that we may have for not sharing the well, It's not my responsibility. Right? Let the evangelist or let the pastor do it. I'm good at playing keyboard and playing guitar. I'll do that. Oh, that is... Right? Oh, we're all called to reach out. Or... Another excuse could be, I'm living a good life. Why should I go and tell somebody else? Let them find out for themselves. I'm right. Before God, I am right. So I'm happy. Right? Now, that would be a selfish ambition. Right? Our, our responsibility is to make sure that what we have, the others also uh, are open to it. Right? Then finally, Another inhibition is, I'm afraid at what questions that people may ask. Sometimes people ask a lot of questions, right? Questions like, you know, where did God come from? Or why did God do this? Right? And sometimes we don't have the answers, right? Do we have all the answers? No. Right? So it's all right to tell a person that you're sharing the gospel with uh, that, you know, I don't know the answer right now, or I can find out. Um, I'll do a little bit of research. I'll read, and I'll get back to you, right? Now, just because you don't know the answer doesn't mean that, right, uh, you, you're a bad person, or doesn't mean you're not prepared enough, right? Or doesn't mean it should stop you from evangelizing. Sometimes we, had a, we have a bad experience. We say, okay, I think this is not for me, right? Uh, and that's not so. Right? Uh, through the bad experiences, we grow, we mature in it. Right? 
So it, it's with everything. So example, if you're a worship leader and you've had a bad experience, will you stop being a worship leader? I hope not. If you're called to be a pastor and you had a bad experience, right? You shared, you I remember the first time I had to share the word. It was for 45 minutes. I prepared for one hour just to be on the safer side. I went on stage. I don't know what I said. 15 minutes is over. 15 minutes, all what I had to say is done in 15 minutes. So what to do the rest of the time? And I thought, this is not what I should be doing. right? Uh, maybe this is not what I'm called for. But then we learn over time. Yes? Right? Say, so, okay, let me, I need to know how to put across certain things. There are certain examples I should use. This is the way I should minister. This is the way I can, you know, bring context to scriptures. And you'll be learning that in hermeneutics as well. So don't be afraid when you see people asking you questions. Or don't be afraid when you don't know the answer. Or you have, you know, some in some way we may have not given a right answer. Don't be afraid to... Uh, you know, say, God, no, I will continue, right? You've got to have that in, in you. Say, God, no, even though I made a mistake, I will continue to do what you have called me to do, right? And God's grace is always there with us. So let's make these three declarations. Do you see that on your notes, right? I am an ambassador. I'm not ashamed. I have no fear. Shall we say that together? Yes or no? Okay. First one. I, second one. Amen. Right? That should be a, a revelation in our hearts, right? I am, I am an ambassador of Christ. I am called to represent Jesus. Two, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And three, I have no fear. Right, and, and so I just want to put this out, right? All of us, uh, when we journey through this whole ministry that we have called for, whatever we are called for, uh, over time we will learn, right? So don't be hard on yourselves when, you know, when you're not able to minister to people or you feel that you've not done a good job or you feel that, you know, uh, I was not able to flow in the gifts of the Spirit, right? Don't be hard on yourself. But what it should pursue you to do is to go after God for greater things. God, give me, anoint me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to do what you want me to do, right? So in terms of anything that you're doing, right? The morning prayer, the morning devotions, whatever you're doing, uh, you know, when you come and you have the supernatural hour and all the times of prayer and worship, let there be this desire of God, I want to know you more, right? And, and that's when the Holy Spirit anoints us for things ahead, right? So let's move to chapter 5. How do we get started? Ask leading questions. Now, as ministers of God, we must learn to ask questions, right? Because when we ask questions, we are opening up the person to his, his or her own assumptions, right? Let's look at this example. What did Jesus do? They came to Jesus and they said, Okay, Jesus, here's the coin. Should we pay taxes? What did Jesus reply? Yes, pay your taxes. Did he reply that way? What did Jesus say? Right. Who's, whose face do you see on the coin? Right? So he answered, a quest, he answered a question with a question. And so they had to answer it back. Right? They had to say, OK. So you're opening up the person as to why he's asking that question, he or she. You're trying to find out what is the reason. You know, in the Bible says that they tried to trap Jesus by asking that question. So many a times, people may try to trap you right? by saying, hey, why did, why did God do this? Right? Why did God create the uh, garden when he knew that Adam and Eve are going to sin? And people will try to trap you with all kinds of questions. Right? So you can always ask a question back. 
So you're trying to understand why is that person asking that question? And that's what Jesus did, right? We must understand that even more important is knowing how to listen. So when we are ministering to people, it's also important to listen to the person. You know, sometimes we can be in a place where we are so used to talking. We'll talk and talk and talk on our own. We keep talking. Sometimes God says, keep quiet. You listen to others. What did Jesus do in the temple? He, he sat, he listened, and he talked to them. If I'm only talking, I'm not getting the opportunity to listen to their problem or listen to their situation. And I always, and it's it's so it's so important to have good listening skills. Yes, when somebody asks a question, it's very important to listen to them, right? Because we are so used to talking. Yes or no? Right. And sometimes a question only needs one or two words as an answer, but we give a long list. Actually, okay, where are you from? I'm from Bangalore is the answer. But actually what happened was I was born in Delhi. Then from Delhi, I went to Afghanistan. And from there, I went to another place. Where are you from? It's a simple question. But we can make that question so complicated. Yes? What is the timing of your college? What time the college starts? Eight to four. Simple answer. Actually, we start at eight, but sometimes it starts at eight fifteen, and then after that we start breakfast, and then ask all that, right? What is the question? What is the timing? Eight to four. The second question I'll ask is, what you do from eight to four? Then you explain, right? So listening is very important. Many times we end up in trouble because we have not listened to the question in the right way. Right? And when we don't listen, we are not able to understand the other person. Right? So here, the Lord Jesus is, is asking the question. He's listening to them. He's trying to find out why are you asking me this? You know it's right, you have to give tax. I can't come and change the law. Jesus is saying, uh, he's not explaining anything. Is he explaining? Right? Is he saying, see, past hundred odd years, the Roman government has taken over Jerusalem. Okay. After the Romans took over Jerusalem or Israel, so we can't do anything. So we are under their law. So as by, by rule, whatever we earn, we have to give it to, uh, you know, a portion goes for taxes. And then the one tenth goes to God. So they built a temple for us. Right? We have to go and give it to God. Is there any explanation? No. He's only trying to find out why are you asking that. Because you can't change that law. Jesus being God, he didn't want to change that law. It's a law. It's there. Right? It's a rule. But Jesus is giving this beautiful answer. He's asking, why? Whose face do you see? So asking leading questions. So let's look at an example. Um, somebody will ask you, uh, hey, why do you believe in uh, a man who died on the cross, such a cruel death? Why do you believe in that? What are you going to answer to them? You know why? I'll tell you. The Lord Jesus came in a manger in Bethlehem. Okay. From Bethlehem, he traveled all the way to Galilee. There he changed the water into wine. He all the blind eyes started seeing. Huh? The deaf started hearing. He walked on the water. Tell me who else has done this? Right? Then he they caught him, they beat him because he was you know, doing these miracles. He died on the cross. That's why I believe in them. Is that the answer we'll give? The first thing he'll say is, I don't care about Bethlehem. I don't care about Israel. Right? The simple question was, why did you believe? Why do you believe in Jesus who died on the cross thousands of years ago? And that too, it was a cruel death. Right? So you can always ask the question back and say, what, what is it that you feel is, was, cru was cruel in that death? 
or do you believe that there was a man named Jesus? You say, yeah, I, I know there was a man named Jesus. What do you understand about him? So he's giving you half the answers. What are you doing? You're just listening to him. He's only telling, right? Yeah, I believe he, he was a man. He did all these miracles. So half your work is done. What do you have to do next? Present, right? Present in the right way. But you're asking the right questions, right? Are you happy with your life? Are you happy that you know, you're in this situation right now? Or maybe you're going through a problem. Are you satisfied with your life? Right? You can say, hey, I'm, I feel satisfied. But are you satisfied with your life? You're opening up the question to that person. Right? So learn to ask leading questions. The problem with us right, is sometimes we have so much of knowledge. Yes? So much of knowledge of oh, first semester over, second semester, third semester. By the time you finish sixth semester, the knowledge has become so much. Where do I preach? <laughs> Ready to preach. Right? Give me a mic, I'll preach. Like that it is. No, no, no. Sometimes it is just sit and listen to others. Right? Sometimes it is asking a simple question. Right? I remember this one friend of mine, he says, uh, we, you know, we were just talking and he said, uh, hey, uh, we don't have enough food, so let's order food. And I smiled, right? Because I thought of how Jesus took the five loaves of bread and two. He asked me, why do you smile? I said, no, I just thought of something. And I asked him, do you think food can be multiplied? How do you think about that? He said, food definitely cannot be multiplied. Right? It was a simple question that I asked. Can food be multiplied? The natural, no. It opened up a whole conversation. I kept asking questions. Right? So it's very important that we learn to listen to others' perspectives. Right? Understand. Ask the right questions. Don't just ask questions because I have to ask. Right? You get what I'm saying? Hey, oh, if somebody comes up to you and says, you know what, I'm feeling very tired today. Being very tired, go sleep. Now, we didn't ask the right question. Did he say tired physically or mentally? Right? The problem with us is we try to find the solution very fast. Right? But that's not so. The Lord Jesus has taught us to ask leading questions, ask good questions. Don't ask you know, uh, uh, questions that are not relevant to what's happening. Right? If somebody is talking about God's love, don't suddenly go and talk about revelations. You know, one day Jesus is going to come back, then you see. Oh, you're talking about God's love, right? Stay on that. Right? Ask good questions. Now, there are different conversations where different questions can be appropriate, like getting to know the person. Like, what do you do for a living? Or where do you study? Right? And I love what happens in, in this whole. Uh, you know, uh, when Andrew, Andrew is John the Baptist's disciple. Yes? What does John the Baptist say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So go and follow him. So Andrew goes following Jesus. Right? And Andrew's listened to Jesus everything and he says, let me find Peter, my brother. It's a wonderful story. You know, you can just picture it. Andrew is with Jesus, whole day he's sitting and listening to Jesus. And what does he say? Oh, he may be the Messiah. So let me go find my brother. He goes and finds Peter. And he says, Peter, come. I think we found the Messiah. Did Andrew think, oh, one day Peter is going to be the leader of the church and he'll stand in front of thousands of people and uh, share the gospel? And did he think all that? All he did was, I have to go tell my brother, bring him and come to Jesus. Right? So, when it comes to asking different levels of questions, you can always ask, right? Like, uh, picture this the Lord Jesus in John chapter 4, he's with a Samaritan woman. What is the woman doing? He's, have you read John chapter 4? Samaritan woman, right? So he's taking out the water. What does Jesus ask? Can I have a drink? Can I have some water? 
right? It was a simple question, right? But that whole conversation was turned into something else. How is it that you, being a Jew, asking a Samaritan for water? So you know what's the difference between a Jew and a Samaritan, right? So the Jews hated the Samaritan. How is it that you're asking me for water? And two, I'm not even a Samaritan man, I'm a woman, right? And three, you're asking me for something you know you, you know you can get, but why are you asking me? You can just come and take. Right? But there's a reason why Jesus asked that question. He knew that there's a time, there's a purpose for this. Right? And so if you read that entire chapter, he had a very pointed conversation with the Samaritan woman. Right? He says, hey, uh, the Samaritan says, uh, I know there's a time when we will also worship God in the temple. What does Jesus say? Time is coming, has now come, where people will worship the Father and Spirit and in truth. Right? And then what does she say? Okay, let me go. You know, and 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 uh, before that, she says, uh, you know, uh, yes, I am married. And Jesus says, yeah, you are married. You you've been married seven times, and the one you're staying with also is not your husband, right? And so she's opened up to everything, just ready for the gospel, right? So getting to know people and having pointed conversations are very important, right? While ministering to people. Two is getting to know their belief system. Uh, for example, would you consider yourself as a spiritual person? Or if they say no, or, so why not? Or what do you think about a person when he or she dies? Or have you ever been to church? Now, there are many people from other faiths who know Christianity more than us. Right? Meaning they know, they have knowledge of the word. Right? They understand historical aspects. Right? Maybe there are few of them, but they do understand. Right? You, if you talk to a Muslim, he'll know more about Moses than what we may know. And for the first five books, the Pentateuch, right? you have Old Testament survey going on. Right? The first five books, they may know it. Right? So how are you going to ask the questions? You know, you can ask, where are you studying or uh, does anyone, did anyone tell you about God? What do you think about God? What do you think about afterlife? What do you think about uh, evil in this world? Why is it that people are murdering each other, killing each other? Why are rapes happening? Why are all these things happening? Why are the poor being oppressed? What do you think about all of this? So you're asking, you're opening up the person to his or her assumptions. Right. Another way you can always, you know, get people is to invite them to church, invite them to meetings or, you know, you got Easter, Christmas, you talk about these, you know, you open it up for them. What is Easter all about? It's got very little to do with Easter eggs. What is Christmas? And it's sad, no? Now Christmas has become, you know, in, in Western countries, they're removing the Christ out of Christmas. They're saying, they want to make it Xmas. You know, they officially want to make it Xmas because they want to remove Christ out of it. It's only become a celebration of things that things to do. Right? There's no Jesus. There's no Christ in Christmas. So, as believers, you and I can use these opportunities to really bring the Christ of Christmas out, or Easter, or Good Friday. Many people have asked me about Good Friday. It just gives us an opportunity, right? Uh, what did Jesus do? Why do we believe in uh, the cross? And what is the power of the cross? Now, as you're doing all this, remember the verse that we read in chapter 1? For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So as you're sharing this, sometimes you may feel... No, how is this going to touch this person's life? How is it going to minister to this person? Now, you don't worry about that because you're ministering the gospel and it's the power of God unto salvation. So you're doing your part. You say, God, work in this person's life. Right? So let that be an assurance always. 
right? Sometimes, you know, even as you graduate or you move on, you'll get opportunities to teach and preach, right? When you're doing that, it should be anointed. It, it, it has to be, uh, you know, you have to be prepared and anointed of God, right? You cannot go with a blank mind and a, even if you're, you know, leading the worship, can you just go and say, okay, I lead worship? What does a worship leader do? Practice, okay. Hmm? Pray. Most importantly, what do you do? Pray, yes, pray. Pray is most important. After that, what do you do? Song list. Song list you need, no? You can't go there and say, oh, which song? Which song to sing? Next song. Oh, is it on G or is it on C? I don't know. Can you do all that? That means you're not prepared. And the people will know. Right? So what am I trying to get at? When you get opportunities, whatever you get, be prepared for it. Don't go in with an attitude of, okay, I can do it. Don't do that. Don't have a casual attitude. Right? Even if it's the smallest, smallest opportunity. Twen Ten minutes you'll share the word, get into the word. Prepare well. Hey, this 10 minutes I'm doing now, two years down the line, you'll have to do with your church members or in your ministry. That time what you'll do? You'll do the same thing what we've done here five minutes before. Uh, okay. God is love and God loves you. That's, that's not how you can do it. Because if what you do here, same thing you'll go back and do. Are you getting what I'm saying? You don't have a song list here. When you go to church, you'll not have a song list. Song list. No need song list. I am led by the Spirit of God. No, 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 no. Right? Whatever you do, you prepare. Well. The Lord Jesus, I'm sure he prepared. He went away in the mountains. It was not to sightseeing. He went for what? He went for prayer. I'm sure he prepared himself. How did he get those examples, those parables? He would have thought of all these things. You know, the parable of the mustard seed. Do you think he would have just come up with it just like that? He would have prepared in his mind. He would have seen it or probably he would have thought about it. Remember, Jesus had to, you know, the Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom. He was not born and full of wisdom. He grew in wisdom. He prayed. He asked God. He was anointed of God. Right? So. You and I, in what we are doing, whether it's evangelism, whether it's preaching, teaching, leading worship, anything, must be anointed of God. We have to grow in it, right? Mature in the gifts that we have, right? Now, that was one approach, asking questions. What is the second approach? Second approach is called the prayer approach. In the prayer approach, you, you look for insight. You ask the person, hey, uh, what, 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 what are you going through? What is the problem that you have? Somebody may say, hey, uh, you know what? I'm, I have fear. Exams are coming. I have fear. Immediately, what you can say, hey, can I pray for you? The prayer approach, right? You're just coming directly. You're pointing to the problem. Hey, can I pray for you? You know, there are times I've had fear. Uh, but I've just prayed and the fear has gone. You know? I, was, I was able to do well in my exams. Or uh, I had fear of you know, uh, failure. But when I prayed to, the, to God, and this is what happened to me, right? the prayer approach. Or there are financial difficulties, health, family problems. Uh, then there are needs like job or marriage. And then there are plans, meaning uh, career and relocate to another place or uh, anything. You can use this approach. What will you say if uh, somebody says, you know what, I'm, uh, I'm suicidal? What will you say? It's open to those online as well. What will you say? Right? Now, for example, you're, you know, you're all a Bible college students. And maybe you're going to these colleges and all, no? they, and they know, okay, your Bible college, they, they'll ask you, hey, I'm feeling suicidal. 
what will you say come to bible college sorry yeah you can ask very good you can ask questions yes and then what else you can do but before praying what will you do you must tell them no you can you can why are you all whispering okay suggestions then what else what why you're asking the question good okay why you're feeling suicidal what else you can do go on think tell me francis however you want to tell you tell no problem i'll un i'll understand tell just a few words also it's okay tell tell me it's okay don't be sorry try to devote oh counsel them divert their attention ah oh, very good yeah, you can give that option as well right so so for me if i get somebody i'm say example i'm sharing with somebody say hey i'm feeling suicidal definitely i'll ask why what happened get to know then i will tell them this is what god can do and immediately go into the prayer approach right i'll pray for them first and then i'll say see you need help you need over time you need help but this is what god can do for you give them bible verses give them references i right? give them the word of god and just slowly minister to them because things like suicide depression it doesn't go off overnight right it takes time so you can always encourage them you know lead them to a good counselor all these things but you can directly come with the prayer approach right so somebody is going for an interview uh, hey i'm very nervous this is my first interview what will you say now we can we have two options we can say hey interview no you don't get you go to another company you'll get another job there right there are so many companies there yeah. don't worry everything will be fine have chai and you go to your interview don't worry that is just going to you know make that person feel okay for 5 minutes again as he reaches the office he's still going to be but when you pray for them you say hey let me pray for you yeah this fear will go fear is not from god No, you're, you 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 have prepared yourself. You've done well, right? You've done well in your exams. You're prepared. You're preparing yourself for the interview. So, let me pray for you, and you open it up for prayer, right? So this is the prayer approach. If you feel that the person uh, that you're praying for, uh, you know, uh, usually when they have a problem, they will say yes, right? They very rarely they'll say no. I don't want you to pray. If that's so, then okay, just move on. but usually when somebody is in a problem they will say okay they're not going to ask who which god why where was he formed when he came which bc which ad all that they will not ask right all they want is their problem to be solved at that moment right and so you're opening it up for prayer right by saying yes if the person you're uh, ministering to says yes here are the things that can happen you're on page 16 right by saying yes the person has authorized god to become involved in his life right the person has opened his life and authorized god to become involved right so he saying god come he's he's a great for prayer he's opened his life for an opportunity for god and the holy spirit to minister in his life right two by hearing you pray they will witness how a personal relationship with god works i always say this when when you look at other religions it's all about works you do this and i will bless you right you do this and your sins are forgiven right and when you look at other religions it's just like judaism in the old testament right how is it in the old testament you know you go there's a temple there's you know you do your sacrifice it's god and man god is there man is here in every religion is like that but the thing is when jesus died on the cross when that veil was torn 
from top to down. It was an entering for you and I to have access to the Father. So now you have a relationship with the Father. right? You have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. right? Now, for example, let's take somebody here, Francis. I don't get scared, Francis. <laughs> See, I know his name is Francis. Right? But if I want to know more about him, what should I do? Obviously, right? I need to say, okay, Francis said, tell me what happened. What happened in your life? You know, what happened when you were small? What about your parents? Uh, which city did you stay in? What was your lifestyle like? How did you, you know, uh, come across God? How did God minister to you? So I'm trying to understand. Right now, I know Francis. That's it. But I don't have a relationship with him. You get what I'm saying? Right? I don't have a relationship with Francis. I, I, I don't know much about him. I just know, okay, Francis, oh, okay, he's in first year, Bible college student, and he's here, he's studying. But I have the opportunity to sit and talk to Francis continually. Then I'll say, hey, I know, I really know Francis. I know what he's gone through. I know the problems that he went through. I know how he's, his attitude, his character. I know that he wants to learn. I know that. Right? So I get to know the person. Now, the same way with you and I, our relationship with God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus, the Trinity, our relationship with God. I know He is God. I can't say, okay, God, you be God. And I'll be here. It's a relationship. I need to build it. I need to walk in that relationship. Relationship is always two ways. Yes? Mm -hmm. Right? If I say, uh, if Francis says, okay, well, you know, Paul, I'll talk to you. And then Francis is talking and then Francis says, uh, you tell me something about yourself. I'll say, no, I won't tell you. You, you. Now, only I know him, but he won't know me. Right? Now, relationship is two-way. When you are praying for somebody, right, if, if somebody who is going through a need, they will see that you have a relationship with God. And that will touch their lives. Why? Because there's no other religion that has a relationship with God. It's all about works. It's all about you do this and here's a relationship. You say, how come, how come you're praying to God this way? You're calling him Father. You're calling him. And you're saying, God, I love you. And, and you're just pouring out your heart. When they see that relationship, something is going to touch their lives. Right? But that relationship is built over time. Right? Even as you all are here, build your relationship with God. Right? Spend time with the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to minister to you. And it's wonderful that you have supernatural hour every day. Right? You can ask God, God, speak to me. Give me a vision. Give me a thought. Give me a picture. Speak to me. Tell me where I'm going. Sometimes we have this habit of only saying, God, you speak, you speak. Right? Sometimes you can just ask God, God, show me where are the things I'm going wrong. Right? We don't want the wrong to be shown sometimes. No? God, only show me prophecy, word of knowledge, healing. No, ask God, God, show me where you're going wrong. Show me where I'm going wrong. Show me where I should improve myself, where I should, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, change my parts. Where do you think I should spend more time uh, on what work I must spend more time? So you talk to him. If you don't talk, you can't build a relationship. And when you have a relationship, people will take notice. Are you getting what I'm saying? Right? People will notice. You know, when I became, first became a believer, uh, <laughs> I was at home and we were from a Christian home, but we never really prayed and you know all of that. But my parents began to notice something. You know, uh, this guy is something's different, right? He's praying, he's singing songs, and he's worshiping God, or he's you know going to church, he's serving here. I didn't have to show myself. I didn't have to say, "See, I'm going to church now." See, I'm going into for prayer now. I'll come only after two hours. So note the time. I didn't have to do all of that. When you have a relationship with God, people themselves will see it. Right? And, and it was seen. Right? 
because they knew I didn't have a relationship, but all of a sudden there was a relationship. And there was, there, you know, they, they, my parents may be watching TV. It didn't interest me at all. I don't know why. But now I didn't go to the TV and say, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I didn't do all that. Okay, I just didn't have interest. They are watching. They watch, but it didn't interest me at all. Right? So my interests were completely changed. All of a sudden, I was interested in worshipping God, reading the Word. Very interested in that. Was I interested before that? No. I would join them and watch TV. Right? So people will notice that relationship. You don't have to go prove it to people. Right? Don't go and prove yourself. You know, truly worshipping God. Don't do all those things. God knows your heart. Sorry if I'm stern, but that's truth. Yes or no? Yes or no? Right? Yes, there's a place where we worship God, we lift our hands, we do all of that. But is there a relationship? That's the question we must ask ourselves. Right? So even when we're ministering, let people see your relationship you have with God. Is that okay? Yeah. Taking the prayer approach could lead to opportunities to sharing more to other people as well. Right? So that is the second approach. So the third approach is the two-minute approach. Now, we did look at this, um, how you were the salvation experience, how you were before Christ, how you received Christ, and how things changed for you in your life after you received Christ. And so that's the two-minute gospel, the two-minute approach that you can uh, bring to people. And then the power encounter approach. Right? So healing. People say, hey, I, I have problem. I, uh, my, I have migraine headaches always. What is the first thing you must do? Go to this doctor. What do you, what do you say? Pray for them. Do that. Right? And I say this again. When you have, you know, your people are together most of the time. If one of you says, my head is paining, leg is paining, all that, what will you do? First, Stand, make him stand there, pray for him. Right? Then you go get medicine. Or first pray. Right? And Jesus did that, prayed for healing. Wherever he went, he said, be healed in Jesus' name. There was a man, can you believe, 40 years he's sitting in one place. The pool of Bethsaida, 40 years. Now you picture sitting in one place for two hours. After getting up, how you feel? Sometimes your legs feel numb, we do, can't walk. For 40 years, he's there in that place. And what does Jesus say? Get up, take your bed, and walk. Now, Jesus didn't go into the science. Get up, do some exercise, <laughs> stretches, <laughs> check if you're okay, then you take your mat and walk. No, no, no. When Jesus heals, he does it fully. Get up, take your bed, and walk. And you and I have that same authority, that same Holy Spirit. right? And here's the thing. We don't have to think, oh, how can I do it? I, you know, I didn't do I'm only one year in the ministry. No, don't worry about all that. It is not you. It is not your reputation in the, in, on the line. It is God's reputation. Right? And nobody can change God's reputation. If, if in case that person is not healed, is God still the healer or no? So nothing changes, no? Nobody's going to call you false prophet. Don't worry. But you pray for that healing. You get what I'm saying, right? When he saw Lazarus, what did he say? Lazarus, how many days was he inside before, before I call him? How many days? Did he ask all that? No. Right. If it was 10 minutes, okay, maybe something we can do. It's been three days, he's inside. Lazarus, come forth. Right? Just out of authority. Right? Power encounter. Then there's word of knowledge. We saw that uh, in the Samaritan woman as well. Then there's prophecy. The power encounter of prophecy. Getting a prophetic word. Right? You're praying, maybe you're praying, you're talking to somebody. And you get a prophetic word. 
you just know okay this is for him right and you know that okay i have to go minister to that person um look at this example of uh, in the book of uh, i think in second kings right second kings 5 i think when Neman has got leprosy, he goes to Elisha, 2 Kings 5. He goes to Elisha. What does, what does Elisha say? Go to Jordan and dip yourself seven times. Power encounter. A prophetic, just a prophetic word that was. You go dip yourself in Jordan seven times, you will be healed. Naman was like, no, no, no. Not Jordan. Why should I go there? But his servants and his people said, anyway, you've got this sickness. Why don't you just try it? What if you get healed? He's a man of God. He goes and he's healed. And he takes back the sand from that place saying, he's the only true God. Power and counter approach. A commander uh, who was a leader in the army, all of a sudden has accepted God. Right? He's accepted the God of Israel, right? a prophetic word. And then there's miraculous intervention. Maybe it's college admissions, jobs, any opportunities where you get, you can just pray for a power encounter. So any questions regarding this? Right? Are we going to try this? Right? Try it. Right? Don't, don't feel that, uh, you know, I don't think I can try it. Right, try it here. This is a safe place. Right? You try it here. Uh, to get a prophetic word, just pray over people, pray for healing, pray for word of knowledge. Exercise your gifts here so that when you go out, right? Now remember, after two years or three years or however long you're gonna be here, you're going into the world. It's not gonna be a setting like this. Right? So here's your opportunity to you know uh, experiment, to try to grow and learn together. Okay. All right, so got a couple of minutes more. Let's look at the last step. Take appropriate steps, right? Uh, invite the person to pray. Even as you're ministering, invite the person to pray and commit their life to Christ. Uh, if they commit their life to Christ, give them you know, material, probably a Bible, or get them connected to a church, get them connected to a life group. Uh, and so those points are there. Encourage them to read the Gospels, right? Giving them a Bible is very important because sometimes when they become believers, uh, they're looking at you, right? And if you have brought them to Christ, they're looking at you. So you must set the example by saying that, hey, it's not me, right? I may make mistakes going further also, but you look at God's word. God's word is our standard. So you're already setting the example for them, right? Giving them the word of God. Just a few rules of engagement. Show genuine care and love. Right? Don't treat people as projects. Right? One person, tick. Second person, tick. So by the end of this month, 10 people, ah, tick. No, they're not projects. They are people with emotions. Right? So show genuine care and love. Don't be judgmental or criticize people and their other world, world views. So don't judge them for their attitudes. Right? Or don't judge them just because they're still, you know, don't believe in certain things or they don't uh they're not able to put their faith in jesus it's okay give them time work with them right nothing happens all of a sudden right don't have that holier than thou attitude meaning i'm the holiest you all are still learning no right give them all the same opportunities right understand the person uh disciple them lead them to christ that they may be more Christ-like. When it comes to arguments, right, sometimes you're sharing the gospel and suddenly it becomes an argument. What will you do? Stop. Close it. Walk away. Finish it off. Just say, no, it's okay. We'll probably continue the discussion another time. We are not called to argue with people. We can debate. But when it goes into a heated argument, just stop. Right? Let it go. Um, and just exit that meeting. Don't let people's negative response put you down. People may tear the invite throat at you. People may say, I don't believe in God. Go do what you want. They may say, Jesus is nobody. They may say many things. 
but don't let it bring you down yes stay in love stay strong and let the joy of the lord be your strength just because somebody doesn't listen or doesn't accept doesn't mean the world is going to end god is calling us to continue strong to continue in love and continue what he has for us right so our goal is to use everyday settings you know, whatever we have around us you know it could be sharing with anybody how many how many of you have shared with the security why you've shared anybody shared with the security guy vimal very good very good right how many of you have shared with the guy who comes with the uh, with the food I, i i don't think you get to speak to him much but with the cab drivers that you'll go every sunday or you know just use everyday settings and bring the gospel but it should be a passion inside us a passion for souls a passion to touch lives amen amen is that okay so we'll stop here we'll close in prayer and next week we'll continue with chapter 6 let's pray father we want to thank you so much for who you are and what you do in our lives we thank you for your goodness and for your mercies that are new every day oh god and lord we thank you for the cross we thank you for the price that you paid that we are, we can call you our ch- our father and lord we love you we worship you we glorify you we pray god that in everything that we do oh god that we be anointed that you will oh god fill us with your holy spirit oh god that we will lord truly lord fulfill this commission to be salt and light in the city in our nation and the nations of god we pray for your empowering we pray for your wisdom upon each one of us of god and lord even as we are here together we pray that we will grow in your word grow in your knowledge and your understanding grow in the working of your holy spirit and that in everything that we do oh god that we may glorify your name lord we thank you we thank you for what you're doing in our lives in this season and what's ahead for us oh god we give you all the praise and glory in jesus name we pray Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you everyone online students. God bless.